Okay, I got a question for you guys. What's a bigger nightmare monster for you? An enemy that attacks from above or an enemy that attacks from below? Yes. Let's let's <laughs> let's roll on this. Eighteen. I got Thirteen. A, I got a ten. Dan. Above. You don't like monsters attacking from above? Uh, mostly because if they're from above, they're coming with stealth. Below, you might at least feel the tremor coming up. And that was a very specific choice of words because Tremors is a great movie. Touche. Touche. So is it birds that freak you out? Birds? Uh, bats? Uh, birds, well, they don't freak, yes, birds and bats. Insects? Sturges, specifically, maybe? S- yes, yes. I don't know. I'm the opposite. I feel like if it was coming at me from above, I would have the chance to run. Whereas, like, below me, I, I feel like it would be able to feel where I was running and it would know where I'm going. Uh, yeah, I guess that's... Uh, Speaking yeah. of tremors. Yeah, you got to walk without <laughs> rhythm or uh, you'll attract or the worm, right? Or stand completely still and never move ever again in your life. No, for me, it's below as well. But I... Look, these things are masters of a 3D environment and I am not three-dimensional in my... Like, we all exist on a 2D plane, right? When we In our movement. We all are across the surface, the end. If it's coming from above, I can duck. I can get out of the way. I have a little bit of agency to get the fuck down. You can bat it with a bat. Right. But when something is coming up from below, and I'm specifically thinking water now, because that's terrifying. Oh, yeah. Oh, I don't deep, like dark the water. Ocean. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm legitimately terrified of open water. And no, that's that's a deal breaker for me. I don't, I don't want that. I don't like that. No, thank you. <laughs> when a little piece of seaweed touches your toe. Oh, fuck that. <laughs> I don't, I'm, I'm wondering why seaweed is on the fucking land. Because I am not going in the water. <laughs> it's a Mimic, the roundtable Dungeons & Dragons discussion podcast, where you never know what you're going to get. Welcome to another episode in our conversation about monsters in D&D 5th edition. I'm Adam, and with me this week are Dan and Megan. Hello. Hey. And this episode is called Monstrosities. Horrifying monsters, but it's ma monsters. Ma- monsters. monsters, monsters, not monsters. It's ma monsters. So it, it, it sounds it sounds almost like a Boston accent. Monsters, yeah. Except for the hard R at the end. Monsters. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> monsters. That's actually, pretty good. <laughs> I'm impressed. So. We've talked about monstrosities in the past, right? We've we've done an episode on monstrosities. We, did, we covered the uh, the Kraken and the Astral Dreadnought and... The uh, Phoenix and... No, 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 no. That's not a monstrosity. That's an elemental, Dan. That's an elemental. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the Yeah, the Kraken, the Astral Dreadnought, and the... Shit, that was a long time ago. Tarrasque. Tarrasque, yes. yes. <laughs> really missed that one, didn't you? So, uh, as we're going through all of these big high-level monsters, I wanted to circle back to monstrosities, and I wanted to tackle some of the ones that... People don't really know exist because they don't exist in the Monster Manual or Mordenkainen's. Volos does have monstrosities, but not the big epic tier, tier four level shit yeah. like we're talking about today. So I wanted to jump into some of the other settings a little bit and see what big scary shit that they've got there as far as specifically monstrosities. Because um, it's pretty easy for me to throw together a, a really big... Demon, I just make whatever demon it is gargantuan, right? Yeah. I, I could do that with a construct fairly easily, but monstrosities are also weird, and they've all got their own kind of bizarre rules and, and whatnot about them, and there's no real constant connecting feature between one monstrosity and another. The way that aberrations are all from the Far Realms, the way that um, undead are all uh, previously living, the posthumous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we, we just, we don't have that. Yeah, it's not like we, they were all created by the same thing. It's not like they were all around the same time existing. Like, they're all just very different. That's right. The idea here is that monstrosities, I mean, generally speaking, were at one point created by a wizard. That's the basic headcanon on most of this stuff. Yeah. Um, they don't really say that anymore, anywhere in 5th edition. But that's a holdover from previous editions. And it's a big factor in Eberron. Right, because they've got an entire one of their houses, which is just dedicated to building new crazy monsters. Ravnica does that as well. It's the uh, the Simic hybrids. Yes, there's an entire race of humanoids that just like to graft aquatic creature bits onto their bodies and become better, quote unquote better, slimier at least. Girl, use a couple more tentacles and Dan's opinion. Oh yeah, always. <laughs> Just extended silence, eh? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Just, yeah. just just staring you down, Dan. You'll love it. <laughs> I, I am you, ma- you gave me the like uh, 
I'm I'm gonna break the br- br- uh, sorry breach the curtain here a little bit, but like you gave Ew. me the the <laughs> rolling ball of snakes and 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 serpents for the monstrosity from that I'm covering today, and yeah, man, more the more snakes, the more tentacles, the more things that move weird. I have a problem with snakes. I love them, but the way they move is otherworldly. So yes, any the more tentacles, more snakes, more like if I was an evil wizard. It would just be snakes everywhere. Just a a, a wall full of snakes hanging off and dangling. Why has it always got to be snakes? Okay, Indiana Jones, settle it down. (laughs) No, I... I, And that's the thing about monstrosities that I I like is the fact that they're not like beasts. With a beast, you know what you're getting into. Even the beasts that are like, oh, it's a winter wolf. It's a wolf, but it has cold magic shit to it, right? Like, you, you know what you're getting into. With the monstrosity... It pops up, oh, hey, that there's a lion over there, and it's got wings. And I was like, oh, shit, a flying lion. And then, like, no, it's going to shoot some poisonous spines at you from the treetops. Yeah. What? Right? Like, you just don't see this shit coming. Yeah. They also have, like, personalities, too, right? Like, yeah. I feel like that's the difference between them and beasts as well, is that they have a purpose for living. Whereas, like, beasts are like, I'm going to eat you. And that's basically Yeah, it. yeah, your beasts are operating on a survival instincts yeah. almost. Whereas these guys have a goal in mind. Most of them do. Some of them don't. Mine oh, doesn't. Ridiculous. Mine is just a big, scary, creepy thing up in the sky. Right? So, like, we wanted to grab one. We got one from Acquisitions Incorporated, which is the most underrated fucking D&D book, in my opinion. I was um, going to say, I never bought it. So I don't... Nobody has bought it. Everyone looks at it and says, oh, the art's cartoony and I didn't listen to the podcast. I don't give a shit. Yeah. But there's some good Cthulhu level nonsense going on in that book. Um, it also, as a from a mechanical standpoint, the options it gives classes is is great because you get jobs as well as classes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it fleshes out backgrounds. Yeah, kind of, and it adds humor. Just kind of like in how the dare they? D and D is supposed to be serious business, right? And oh, so, okay. but <laughs> but no, it, it's it's really really cool. It's, it is a lot of fan service. But it's underrated. And yeah. then we also went to the two uh, Magic the Gathering um, uh, campaign settings for this episode as well. Dan, you got one from Theros. Yep. And I got one from Ravnica because they're also weird and radically different. And nobody's buying these books. Buy the books. If, if you didn't pick them up on the first round, chances are you're not picking them up. Like, you're you're not a big enough D&D fan if you didn't catch it the first time <laughs> around. Yeah. Like, if you're checking in, in now and you pick up the Player's Handbook and the Monster Manual... You're not picking up Ravnica next, right? It's not the next thing that most people are picking up. Yeah. And there's some really fun, interesting things in these books. So we just wanted to highlight that a little bit today. So um, do you guys have any thoughts? Do you like monstrosities as a general rule? What do you use them for in your campaigns? Let's roll dice and everybody get the spotlight for a second. Three. Four. I got a seven. Yay, more of my voice. (laughs) Um, I like monstrosities because I like to throw beasts and then a monstrosity directly thereafter. Like, beasts are a lot of fun to to fight at low levels. And then the first time that you run into a real monstrosity after you've been fighting giant toads for a while, yeah. it feels fantastical. It feels like real fantasy D&D has set in now. We're done fighting dire wolves, and now there's a freaking chimera, right? Like, I mean, that's a hell of a leap. But there's... Um, and then some, yeah. Yeah. But there's... Uh, there's a real purpose, especially the end of tier one and all the way through tier two for monstrosities to really shine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there are so fucking many of them. You never know what's coming next. Right. Yeah. I, I, I really like monstrosities uh, to build on that. Like they're also because they're usually amalgamations of so, several beasts plus a little bit of nightmare fuel pinched in there. Um, you can usually use a monstrosity to um, set your party back on their back foot right like you you could give them a little bit of uh caution because they see a snake head and then that snake head turns into a hydra they see like and and just grows and grows and grows in front of them and and they have expectations when it comes to the snake head but they don't go through with it um so i like monstrosities as that stepping stone my big problem with a lot of monstros- monstrosities and i'm glad we're covering these later ones is because once you hit a certain point in the game, monstrosities are just speed bumps. Like there's there's not a lot of uh, once you figure campaign out- arcing stories. Like it's hard to make a monstrosity your big bad guy. It depends. Yeah. Like there are some there are a lot of monstrosities in and around Yuan-Ti 
If you're going up against UNT cults, then you're going to run into them. Yeah. But, and I mean, there are some that are intelligent enough that they're going to have their own language. They're going to have their own schemes and plans, but they're, um, they're, I mean, they're uh, not like, they're not big, big, big picture monsters. Oh. They're they're usually the like you release the kraken like you they they uh, are a weapon. I see used. the kraken is the exact one that I was thinking of that is not the good example. You release a tarask, yeah, and the tarask is the speed, but it's a big speed bump. That that's a hill, yeah, right. But, <laughs> but it's it's not um, it's not got big designs on world domination. The kraken does though. The kraken does very much want to enslave the surface dwellers and bring them down into its realm and like. The, uh, that the Kraken is, I think, the one yeah. example of. I mean, it's now a warlock patron. So. Yeah, which is really great. I'm I'm looking forward to actually reading that because I haven't seen it yet. Um, but the idea that like the astral dreadnought, like it's big and it's scary, but that's what these things are for. They're meant to be big and scary, and then wow, I can't believe we defeated that beast. I feel like Hercules, and then I move on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, and you're right. They do feel a little bit like. Like henchmen, almost. Yeah, or... right. Like I, I, I look at it in like a literary uh, frame of mind. Where if you have a story where you're fighting uh, uh, the Tarask, right? You're stopping this big thing before it destroys a city because the city's in its path, or it has been unleashed toward the city, right? You're not stopping this gigantic thing to before it destroys the city because it has a vendetta it's against an evil that plot city, to destroy the world right <laughs> okay so so here's the example we all know what a dragon is a dragon's got real designs yeah and, and opinions and you can go listen to one of our too many dragon episodes that we've done but if we can then turn to dan's favorite movie of all time which is a dungeons and dragons movie oh mm, shit where really? it was your favorite uh, no uh, where Dan always just, com- Dan always just complains no. that, that the beholders were just turned into guard dogs okay Calm they're down. not guard dogs Calm it down. pisses me off like just seeing one floating down a hallway and there there's like chuckle fuck McGee and Tweedle dit and they're just moving their way through the freaking thing behind the it's a it's a ball of eyeballs one could just swing around behind and see it and then I rain disintegrate and there's your freaking story kill Damon Wayne's little brother and move on I love that movie by the way <laughs> oh, it makes, drives me up the wall. The dwarf is taller than the human. Like, what the shit is this? It's such a good piece of cinema. <laughs> <sighs> Jeremy Irons is a national treasure. <laughs> Absolutely. Remember, remember the heyday? The blood <laughs> rain from the skies! Like, like, go you remember the heyday of Thora Birch? Such good times. <laughs> anyway, I wonder what she's up to now. Probably still shorter than a dwarf. Anyway, my problem with that is that they reduced dragons to monstrosities in it. Yeah, yeah, they did. Like, they weren't these big, intelligent, crazy, scary things. They were just giant monsters that could be controlled by uh, by Jeremy Irons' big red rod. Hey, he spent a lot of time in that movie building that big red rod. That's disgustingly accurate, and I hate it. I hate everything about what you just said. <laughs> Jeremy Irons' red rocket controls freaking dragons. Better than movie. the purple worm he sticks in his friend's ear. Everybody stop. <laughs> <laughs> the line <laughs> so i'm gonna go home and watch this movie now again <laughs> why would you do that to yourself oh but it's so much fun <laughs> we're already living in a pandemic time we're tortured enough you do not need to watch such that. a good time I, I you gotta have a drinking game and it's got to be called not in fifth ed and every time they do something that is not in fifth ed like that's not in fifth ed then you have to do a shot you'll be drunk by the end of act one this is something we should do in a socially distanced just all watch this movie as a drinking game in the oh, comfort of our own homes I love it I think I, it's a yeah no idea. I'm 100 that we should like twitch stream it or something yeah. I'm gonna live yeah. tweet it too like when we get to the act no we're gonna make Dan live tweet it so he just rages through it because you know we have our active Twitter account. I feel like, we're like just just to, like I know we're sidebarring like whole to the whole hell right now, but I think it'd be hilarious to start doing mini episodes of reviews of other fantasy movies. I think I think what we need to do is we need to choose the fantasy movies that people haven't seen. Yeah, and then make them sit down and watch it. Like Brad had never seen Jurassic Park and then didn't like it because he's a crusty old bastard. Is what, did I? Did I he that right? sounds about right. I, yeah. In all fairness to Brad, he just wasn't. Um, mentally alive at all. He was mentally dead when Jurassic Park came out. Sure, yes, I know. He was young. I, I get it. He's but... my age. He was not young. He was just an idiot and didn't watch it when it was okay. the appropriate age to watch it. So, I've got a really, really fun story. I saw that movie in theaters with Dave and he was seven at the time. Oh, no. Yeah, I've got a cute little story with that and I'll tell that some other time. But, um, that was hilarious. Love it. Yeah. He... 
did not like. Um, my wife, my wife, uh, she <laughs> cannot watch the Jurassic Park. She hate she hates Jurassic Park. She hates all those movies because and because she saw it once and it scared the hell out of her. So like it is the scariest movie she's ever seen. It's like the weirdly scary movie. Like what movie was? I mean, Jurassic Park was supposed to be a thriller. It's not necessarily scary, but it, it, it's it's tense. For me, Dark Crystal was that, right? Like, it's not supposed to be scary. It's just supposed to be tense and weird. Yeah. And I had nightmares for years because of Dark Crystal. Shan is the same with Jurassic Park. The last unicorn freaked me out when I was a kid. Mm. There are parts in The Last Unicorn that like... What is it? What is it? Um, I think it's a movie called Legend, which was also about unicorns. Yeah. 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 That one freaked the fuck out of me when I was a child. Tim was Curry like, and just way too much face makeup. Whoa. Uh, plenty of face... Like, just that good amount. But now I want to re- I haven't watched that since I was young. I kind of want to We re- should sit that. down and do... Okay, like, alright. Yeah, okay. We're, we're, we're coming up with something here. Yeah. More content! Yay! Yay. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, <laughs> So anyway, I had a point about uh, about the, the Dungeons and Dragons movie. Oh, and it was the fact that dragons yeah. were turned into monstrosities, right? It, yeah. Because they were just big, scary terror beasts, but with magic to them, right? And that's that's the thing. The other difference between a monstrosity and a beast is a monstrosity has that one note magic power that if you don't, if you've never seen this before, you're going to be shocked and appalled when it hits. Mm-hmm. If you have seen it before, it's just another Tuesday. Time to move on. Yeah. Right. So. I feel like all of these things are like ambush. They hit you once, and then you're you're done with it, right? Yeah, yeah. Megan, how do you how do you feel about monstrosities? I, I say like putting everything that you guys have said together. I I like the fact that they're not necessarily the big big bag at the end, but it's something that can grow with your campaign with monstrosities. Is they can be a reoccurring thing that's mm. just like a thorn in your group's side that they just can't kill or can't move or can't get out of the way. Because as we said, like the main difference between beasts and monstrosities is that sometimes monstrosities have a purpose for existence. And if it's revenge or they just don't like your group or they are the minion of something larger, they're going to follow you. I just feel like they're a really cool set piece to use if used appropriately, correctly, and with a little bit of intelligence. I feel like they're so malleable and usable that you can edit them as a DM to fit the storyline a little bit better. Yeah. Give it a rhyme and reason. Like, it, there's only so much you can do with a wolf or a wolf pack or a goblin yeah. pack or a mob mentality type thing. These are more like a good backstory set piece. For maybe even just one of your characters. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I yeah. like the use of them. And also, just if you're going to homebrew a beast to have some sort of magical aspect to it. Oh, this is a wolf that breathes fire because it's a... Half dragon wolf, because half dragon is a template, and you can apply it to beasts. Yeah. You now made a monstrosity. Yeah. Right? And, and I mean... Congratulations, you're an evil wizard. Uh, technically, I'm, I'm talking about, like, from the DM perspective. Technically, when you were sitting there putting the half dragon template on, or the vampire template on, or whatever, it, it stays as a beast, technically. Mm-hmm. It doesn't take on this new kind of dragon or undead aspect to it. But let's be honest, if you're doing this to a beast, you've just made a monstrosity. Mm -hmm. And I would therefore classify it as such when it comes to things like dragons, or not dragons, druids and rangers. Yeah, I got those anime dragons out of druids and rangers. I heard you just say anime dragons. And I made. And made, okay. Yeah. I was like, anime dragons. Anime dragons. (laughs) I... I'm not sure. I, I that, they must exist. They must exist. Shenlong in Dragon Ball I was like, Z. Dragon Ball Z, dude. <laughs> how, did, how did I fucking blank on Dragon I don't Ball know. Z? <laughs> wow. Literally called Dragon Ball. Yeah. Huh. Is that one of the Pokemons? Uh, no. No. God, no. Just no. 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 Yeah. Do they have a dragon in Pokemons? Oh uh, yeah, they got a few. Okay. One of them's literally called Dragonite. So well, Dragon. It's true. I, yeah. Okay. Dragon Air as well. Charizard is a dragon as well. There's a lot. Okay, I'll I'll take your word for it. This is a blind spot for me, obviously. Oh yeah, for sure. In the animes. Oh, um, and you, damn it, Adam. What? <laughs> watch some anime. I I could recommend some great anime shows to watch. <laughs> I'm sitting here looking across the two of you, and I know that you guys are just gonna say like Death Proof. <laughs> That's a good movie. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> All right. So before the internet screams at us, let's move on and actually start rolling some dice here. So we have three different kinds of monstrosities. We're going to roll to see who's going to go first and uh and um break down the stat blocks and whatnot as as we go and kind of the deal behind them, all right? 
I got a nine. Eight. More Adam's voice. <laughs> More of Adam's voice. Okay, well, fortunately, this one is going to be pretty straightforward and short and sweet. I got the easiest of the three of them because there's only so much to be said about these guys. I got the Sky Swimmer mm -hmm. from Ravnica. Now, Ravnica is a really cool setting. I actually think that it is, I prefer it to Theros, like, by and large, by the broad strokes, and even the minutiae. I love the idea of this one massive city-state, and it's got all sorts of crazy shit going on in it that's very urban. It's weird to me that they have a gigantic, they call it a, a leviathan, it's not the traditional elemental leviathan in D&D. Yeah. &D. yeah. But it's weird to me that they've got this gigantic, gargantuan sky monster that is a huge snake with horns and spines and, and teeth so many so many fucking fangs yeah to the point where i'm like where is the mouth on this damn thing it must be hidden the hole for feeding is like the size of a nickel because there are too many fucking fangs in the way of this honestly it the based off the art of it it kind of looks a little bit like a flying sarlacc yeah a little bit they've got it's wearing like a like a viking helmet right like it's <laughs> it and I thought that was a big ass beard at first, but no. It's a teeth beard. Bangs. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so the idea behind the sky swimmer is the fact that it is uh, a gigantic. It's gargantuan and it is unaligned, but it's this massive monstrosity. I did a bunch of research because there's very little about it in the book, besides the fact that they're kind of loosely linked to simic hybrids, and simic hybrids are um, humanoids that have grafted bits and pieces of animals and beasts to themselves usually aquatic creatures like a uh, crab arm with a claw where your where your normal hand would be or a, a tentacle instead that grows out of out of your back or other creepy gross little bits what's the what's the scary fish that has the light bulb hanging angler off fish. the angler fish the angler i want to see a bunch of those guys walking around like humans with just these light bulbs hanging off the front of their faces anyway that's that'd be really useful in my day job you <laughs> would just be sitting there trying to eat it all of the time. You'd be craning right. your head back and, and just... Run, ah, 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 ah. Okay, right. that whole sentence out of context. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the sound bite for the episode. <laughs> Yay. Why are you always going to take us to the gutter, Megan? <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but the idea is that they found these um, smaller serpents that lived uh underwater these aquatic serpents and then they pulled them up into their labs and they made them bigger and bigger and bigger and more horrifying and now these things are so big that they feed on drakes and rocks and griffins and anything else that they encounter as they soar through the clouds that's rocks without a k yeah that's yes the big birds yeah. but but those things are not little like these are all big like they're eating fucking drakes like like dragon cousins. Mm -hmm. They are eating them. Look at them teeth. Yep. So, um, but really the eating is all that they have going for them. It's what they do. So I'm going to bust out their stat block really quickly. Like I said, they're unaligned, which feels almost bestial to me. Um, their AC is 18 and their hit points are 216 on average. That's not a whole lot for, for a gargantuan beast. Yep. When you see that this is CR-13, this is a pretty big badass CR-13. I feel like this punches outside of its weight class, but it's not a tier 4 monster by any means. Mm -hmm. A couple of these, though, would be great to fight against if you've got a adult brass dragon on your team, right? Like, mm -hmm. there can be some really cool stuff to, to do with them, but they are exactly what Dan was saying before. They're just speed bumps to get by. Their speed is only 10 feet on the ground, but it's 60 feet when they fly. So never have them land. There's no point. There's no purpose to it. They're giant serpents that, I mean, I'm looking at the at the art where it's got like the the middle of the body comes up vertically out of the clouds and then dips back. Kind of like uh, all those Japanese um, paintings of sea serpents and whatnot yeah. with the yeah. multiple humps sticking out of the waves. So I figure like that's how they fly is they undulate their body up and down to move through the air which is kind of neat it's cool yeah. we, we don't have anything else that really does that even the coatl which is a flying snake has wings this just somehow flies um they've got incredibly high strength pretty good decks and con their wisdom is 
entirely average, but their intelligence, charisma is their lowest. And intelligence is a seven and charisma is a six. These are not dumb. They're, they will understand what's going on. They're, they're not people. They're not the average person, but they're probably able to handle themselves better in a fight than, say, a, a basic ogre would. Mm. Okay. As far as their basic instincts and their ability to use tactics, they're going to hide in a cloud and come out when the time is right. They're going to be able to size up when a threat is too big and retreat. Yeah. Right? And so um, their only saving throw is a constitution, which is plus eight. Like, it's the only boost to any one of the saves. Their skills, the only one is perception plus six. And the past perception is 16. Like, I'm not blown away by any of this, right? No, yeah. No. Um, languages, none. And they are amphibious. It can breathe air and water. Could I just say, I'm kind of glad that they don't have any languages, because how the hell would you talk with that mouth? Right? <laughs> maybe, maybe it does have language, it just can't speak. Yeah. Um, no, it, it's got the ability to breathe both air and water, which is loads of fun, because you can have these things erupting out of lakes and stuff as well. I really want to pull this... Into other campaigns. Mm -hmm. Because no one is going to see this come. When they hear about, oh, the serpent that lives in the lake. They're all going to think dragons. Or, you know, the, the serpent on the, on the mountain. And, oh, there's a purple worm up there. Nah, you got this son of a bitch coming out of the sky. Yeah. Having these guys. I want to see a storm giant riding one of these guys. Oh, that'd be Ooh. cool. So, they do get a multi-attack. They get three attacks. One with its bite and two with its slam. I'm going to do the slam first because it's... it's uh, well, it's poetry. It's a plus 11 to hit, and its reach is 30 feet, so it just kind of hits you with its body. I assume this is actually a tail attack. It can hit only one target at a time, but only does 2d12 plus 6 bludgeoning damage. Hmm. At the point that you run into this, you're shrugging that off. That's going to be real scary for spellcasters. Yeah. But that's it. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and with the plus 11 to hit, that's not even a guaranteed hit at this point. That should be more damage. Like, just by the overall size of these things, if it's choosing to hit you with, like, a section of itself, it should be more than just 2d12. That's what I'm saying. Like, it feels a little bit weak. The range is nice. The range is really nice because, especially when you have the bite, which has a 10-foot reach as well, and uh, it gets two of these, remember. The attack is plus 11 to hit, one target, 3d10 plus 6 piercing Ooh. damage. Okay. Mm. So that one, and you're doing that twice. If the target is a large or smaller creature, it must succeed on a DC-19 deck save or be swallowed by the Sky Swimmer. Ah, oh, my favorite. Yeah. Remember, it can do that twice. There's no, like, it, you don't wait on that. You just have to, if you fail, it can eat two of your party members and then hit that guy over there from 30 feet away. So it almost doesn't really have to be that strong. It just has to... It just has to hit. Eat you. Yeah. 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 Um, if a swallowed creature is, or sorry, if you are swallowed, you're blind and restrained, which is normal for the swallowed condition. It has, uh, you will have total cover against attacks and other effects outside of the Sky Swimmer. And you take 6d6 acid damage at the start of each one of the Sky Swimmer's turns. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you can do 30 damage to it or more on a single turn from inside, then it will vomit you out if it fails a DC 18 con save. So... There is a way for you to get spat back out. Uh, you have to fall prone in space within 10 feet of the Sky Swimmer. And, of course, if it dies, you're no longer restrained. And you can escape by using 15 feet of movement. And you exit prone. But remember, you're up in the sky. Yeah. So I was going to say, if you're, if you're out at 10-foot space around it, um, one, that's quite still a lot of territory you could, you could pop out of. And two, down. Yeah, right. And so here's, here's my thought process. If I've got if I got sixty feet of movement and ten foot reach, and I'm going to swoop down, I'm going to say for thirty feet, hit you, use my tail attack on that guy, hit the other guy. Now swallow two of you, and I'm going to fly up thirty feet. Well, at the beginning of my next turn, you're going to take sixty six acid damage, and I'm going up another sixty feet, and I might just dash because I'm just going up. I want to get out of range of things. So now you're 150 feet up in the air. That's one d six per ten feet of falling damage. This yeah. this could this could get out of hand real quick. Yeah. After you've taken the sixty six damage from the acid. Yeah. And the three d ten from getting eaten in the so, first. Place. So on your next turn, you are going to take twenty one d six. One second. My my cr thirteen. Yeah. Have my, fun. My yeah. point is, you need feather fall if you're going to fight one of these things because it's taking you up with it, right? Yeah. That's its thing. But that's what 
I'm trying to think of. Is like, in what circumstance would you ever be in the sky where you encounter one of these, if not with abilities to fly any or airship. Be air shipping or something? Yeah, any time that I'm going to give my party an airship, there will be sky swimmers in this world. Mm. These things are perfect fodder for tier three combat on the side of a of a yeah airship. that's amazing for that this yeah. is a great random encounter i don't need a reason for one of these guys to come out of the sky yeah they're just coming to eat and i can see them just taking chunks out of sails or balloons or um you know the hull of an airship or if it's your elemental binding ring because you've stolen it out of out of eberron yeah. you know taking bits and pieces out of this and now you've got a sky swimmer versus an air elemental as your ship is plummeting to the ground this could be some really fun set piece shit that you're doing with one of these guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, anytime that you go up to cloud cities, like there's one in Eberron as well, it's the top of Sharn. They've got a whole district that lives on a floating cloud. And of course, storm giants. Yep. Right. Like there are ways to get up there and see these things. Now I like these things as tremors from the movie Tremors in a cloud city. Like you're walking up to the cloud city and these guys are roaming around outside and you can see the, the humps as they dive. In and out of the clouds, right? Yeah. yeah. No, I, I I love the idea, like, um, having these even be, like, a known threat, but they keep them away from the city for some reason. And there's, like, an entire organization within the city keeping these large sonic engines um, running so that it keeps the sky swimmers away. And then you can have an entire campaign arc where one of these uh, sonic engines dies. And now the sky swimmers are coming to the city. Sorry, why a sonic... I don't know, it just sounded cool. Like, the, these things, like, they don't have very much language. They're not very smart, everything else. I, They've got a seven intelligence. I've seen players dumber than that. I, I, and I don't mean player characters. <laughs> uh, hi, my name's Dan. <laughs> um, but their perception for a CR 13 creature is not great. So I'm, I'm going, these guys are kind of... Opportunistic. Opportunistic. They're going to hit what they can in their path. So if they're kept away from a thing, like, they're... They're kind of like a, a wild animal in that respect, right? Like if if you could prove disinteresting enough, they're just going to or by. or enough of a pain in the ass they don't want to until they get desperate. They're not going to yeah kind right of attack. Hmm. So you got this massive flying city. Well, these things are going to attack. So they have this system to kind of keep them away by just making this annoying noise. And that's why I went sonic, right? Because in the air that that noise is going to carry far fall far fall up uh, far farther than. Um, you could have just used the, the word further. You know that, right? <laughs> no. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, <laughs> so I, yeah, I really like these. My big question is, I want you to look at how big these motherfuckers are. They're huge. These things will blot out the sun. How much do they need to eat in the span of a day? All of it. They don't live off of clouds? No. Okay. Um, I'm going to assume that they do most of their hunting underwater. Because you're going to find lots of fish, lots of big things to eat underwater. They are amphibious. Do they have a swim speed? Sorry? No, they don't. So would you include that their fly speed is their swim speed? I would, personally. Oh, yeah. 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 It makes sense. Especially if that's the way they fly, is like the movement of your tail. Like that. Considering the background that I found for them, where they would come from, the fact that they are amphibious, but they don't have a fucking swim speed, which is just odd Weird. to me yeah. yeah but yeah absolutely they'll be able to dive they'll move it to 60 feet i might even half that because it's difficult terrain for them so 30 feet which is still respectable but they're going to be able to hunt down things like sharks they will you know how how sharks and things will will jump up and like eat a bird mm -hmm. and then land again in the water these guys are doing that but the opposite they like are up in the air and they dive down and grab like an eagle fishing yeah yeah kind of and and but I think that they can live underwater, they can stay down there, but it's safer for them in the sky because what is going to hunt this thing up there? This is why the Ogopogo was never discovered because, because the sky he flies into the sky. That makes sense. He is in the Canadian Rockies. Yeah. Hmm. 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 Who's next? <laughs> Me. Well, before we get to you, we're going to Aww. cut to a commercial. Hello, podcast people. But podcast people? We're recording. Yes, but it makes them sound like pod. People. We're recording. You're recording. Fuck. Hello, podcast people. We've got a couple of things going on that you might not know about, and so we thought we'd cut away to a little reminder. First of all, we just want to point everyone to our YouTube channel again. We appreciate that all of you listen on your respective favorite podcast apps. 
but the It's a Mimic YouTube page has all of our shows laid out in playlists. That means you can listen to our Dragon episodes back to back or dig through the Campaign Builder or touring the Multiverse series without scrolling through the backlog or having to use a search function. New episodes get uploaded within a week of airing on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or whatever, but the whole backlog is up there. Even the episodes we're embarrassed about. Yeah, fuck, those early cold opens were sloppy. Yeah. And delicious. The other thing we want to mention... Hey, Dan, you know what else is sloppy but delicious? Whatever you're going to say next is just going to get cut, so... Well, the other thing we want to mention is our sneaky little store that lives an unassuming little life on our website. There are stickers, magnets, phone cases, notebooks... Cups, water bottles, coffee mugs, and travel wait, mugs. Wait, 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 I can have a mug? I'm tired of your ugly mug already, man. I want a mug. Ooh. We even have masks in a variety of sizes because we're socially conscious people. The current designs are for the It's a Mimic mic and the Deep Dark Irradiance logo, but we'll be updating the store as time goes on. How big are the mugs? I don't know. There's a standard one and a tall one. And a travel mug too. Jesus, I need to look at this website more often. So, please, take a second to check out what we have to offer. We really appreciate the donations we've received through the website, but we want to make sure that you guys have the option of getting something for your hard-earned money. Every little bit helps keep the lights on and the side projects rolling, and we love you for your support. So thank you to everyone out there who visits www.itsamimic.com and checks out our online store there. <laughs> hey, there's even a little pin with a logo on it. And don't forget to check out the YouTube channel for perusing the older episodes. Now... Without any further delay, let's head back to the show. Jesus, there are three different kinds of stickers, Dan. We are capitalist whores. Will you please take these damn commercials seriously? No. All right, so my monstrosity that I got is from uh, the Mystic, uh, Mythic Odyssey of Theros. This is... The... I was really hoping you were going to say the Mystic Odyssey. Odyssey? Yeah. Yeah, yeah thanks. <laughs> um, this is the Typhon... Now, I did a little bit of research about the Typhon's history as well, because a lot of the stuff that pops up in Theros has real-world mythic uh, connections, and Typhon is no uh, is not free from this. They're not an exception. There is a real-world connection to old Greek mythology to what the Typhon is. But in Theros and in Dungeons and Dragons 5e, the Typhon is a uh, huge monstrosity. That is definitely chaotic evil. They are from the underworld. They are a roiling, writhing mass of snake and uh, teeth. So hold on. We just have to back up for a second because in Theros, the underworld is not like the underdark. It is the afterlife. Yes. You go down into the underworld where gods reign. Think Greek mythology. You go down into Hades. Yeah. Right. So yeah. this is... You... And often the underworld sh uh, changes and shifts the natures of those who come to it. Um, and the Typhon is the uh, shifted and twisted nature of old mortal warlords, tyrants, um, those who ruled with an iron fist. These, these are kings of slaughter whose souls have been twisted to become a Typhon. So this makes them uh, that, that drive for, that drive to continue the slaughter, continue the mayhem... Um, is all that fuels a Typhon. So they're monstrosities, and they were created by the gods. They're not some evil wizard has created. But that would make them technically a Titan, even though they don't have that, that title. Yeah. In 5th edition, if you're a monstrosity made by a god, you are a Titan. That is a definition of it. Um, and the old world connection that I was talking about, Typhon, who's the king of monsters in Greek mythology, cool. is a Titan. Yeah. Like, well, he straight up is one. That's cool. So um, we'll get to that in a second after I break down the stats here. Well, what do they look like? Um, they are writhing <laughs> balls of snakes. They're like, the picture doesn't do it justice. It is like one big mouth with a bunch of other like snake mouths and like serpentine mouths around it. It it um, It is just a rolling, writhing ball of snakes and mouths. That's all it really is. Uh, they're all connected, so like there's a stomach in the middle, but they're just... Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, the the closest analog I can think of that might be a little bit more familiar to D&D uh, &D players would be like an Odiog. So it, it's kind of got that one really big mouth and, and a bunch of little legs and then the tentacles on top. Just multiply the tentacles by 4,000 and make all of the ends of them instead of just the grabby claws, literal snake heads. I don't like any of this. Does it, does it have legs? 
Uh, I don't know. I think it just kind of like, like a million I, I, it, it kind of rolls like a million snakes and it's just one mass of uh, hive mind snakes. I, I really like it. They're just gnashing teeth and hissing yeah. fangs and yeah, that's cool. I, they're, like, they're, I bet it's wet. It sounds wet. It, it, yes. Yeah, very much so. And, and, and it's a moist horrifying. ball of snakes. But why would it need to be moist? Like snakes I, it, aren't just, moist. Just, it just further, sounds like yeah. it's moist. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the it, sounds it makes are moist. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah it, you you hear it slurping before you. It, 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 oh, and as it grows, slurping and hissing along. Like, oh no, no 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 no! It's it's not wet. It's not wet. That that rustling noise you hear is it shedding snake skin as it Ew. rubs across itself. Now the thing is, these are also from the underworld, so they they'll have chain as well that is going to be dragging along with them and part of it. Like th- this is going to be a cacophony of gross before it gets to you. So, and then it's going to eat you. Delicious. Cool. Yeah. So uh, the Typhon is a huge monstrosity. It's not quite as big as the uh, Sky Serpent or Sky Swimmer. But um, it, it's big enough to pack a punch. It's got an armor class of 17. I mean, yeah. Sure. Right? Um, hit points of 195. What's the CR on this? This is a CR 15. Now, this is easier to hit and has less hit points than what you uh, present. So it's got to be deadlier. It is Far deadlier. This mm. thing packs quite a heavy punch. It's got a speed of 40 feet. Um, so it's going to catch your average player. Um, but your monk's going to be able to run away from it. Which will be nice. Uh, in terms of stats, it is a mountain of strength and constitution. But it's uh, dexterity, wisdom, and charisma are all fairly average. And much like the Sky Swimmer, it's got a 7 int. Yep. But unlike the Sky Swimmer, this thing can speak common. Now, the way I would play this, this being the um, creation of uh, brutality from a long-dead warlord, I would have this be kind of an echo of it, uh, especially since this thing is from the um, underworld. So this thing is going to talk to you much in the same way a ghost would. Come to me. Like in your right? brain mind. It, well, it, well, no, it, it's not going to be in your brain mind, but it, it's... It's got its rep, uh, repetitive statements that just says over and over and over again. Ah, I got you. Right? Um, and it does, it, it has a will, but it doesn't have uh, that strategic mind. Like, it's not going to be planning out. Um, it's going to know the best way to get you. And, and when you, if you're in the area that it knows, in, your, in the lair, and there's a fork in the road that goes left, but it goes a long way around, but the fork in the road that goes right... Gets you there faster. Yeah. It's smart enough to go right and wait for you to show up. Yeah. But it didn't plan that, right? It just instinctively knows because you're Best in its lair. Best course of action. Yeah. yeah. And it's not going to be able to put clues together or hold a real conversation, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's saving throws. It's like yours only got a bonus to constitution. Um, but it does have some damage immunities, which is an immunity to acid. It's a big snake thing. That tracks. Um, and necrotic. It's from the underworld. That tracks. Uh, it's got dark vision to 120 feet. Sorry, not poison? Not poison. Where? Yeah. Uh, it's got dark vision to 120 feet and a passive perception of 11. I mean, the dark vision is, I mean, underworld. Um, snake? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> snake. Reptile. Yeah. Uh, to continue with the snake theme, it does have keen senses on any checks that rely with smell, which gives it advantage on perception checks. And for those of you that don't know this, snakes smell with their tongues. tongues. And that's why they're always out and flicking their tongues around. Those little tongue flicks are them sniffing your odor. So this thing is just a rolling ball of snakes is, and their little snake tongues flicking out everywhere. Yeah. It tastes where you are. I hate everything about this. Yeah. <laughs> um, and here, here, it's about to get better. Um, it has regeneration. Yay! Yay! This is actually my favorite part of this thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, it regains 20 hit points a turn. So it doesn't need a mountain of hit point, a mountain of hit points. It can just regen more so than like a troll would. Like this thing's got some hefty regeneration to it. It feels a little like a Hydra. Um, yeah. Which it, I mean is on theme. It's Theros. There are this major is, Hydras in that. This is kind of like the Hyper Hydra. Sure. Yeah. Um, now with most, uh, things with regeneration, of course, there is a way to stop the regeneration. However, fire will do diddly jack to stopping it. It's purely radiant damage. Only radiant damage will stop this, uh, uh, regeneration process for happening for one turn. Mm. Okay. Now, if it dies, um, 
sorry, the Typhon will regenerate, of course, even after it hits zero hit points, but it will, um, the only real way to kill this thing is if it starts its turn with zero hit points and doesn't regenerate. So if you, it's like a vampire that way. Yeah, if you take it out on uh, like the last hit against it in that last round has uh, radiant damage, you'll be able to kill it. Otherwise, this thing's getting back up next round with 20 hit points. But that's my favorite part of it because this could be a reoccurring like grow with your team revengeful yeah. monstrosity because you if a team doesn't know that, they just like, yay, radiant damage hits it and kills it, but then it's your barbarian that gets the final hit. Like, haha. It's back. <laughs> it's back. So hold on, I got a question. You said those were damage immunities, not resistances, right? Yeah. There's no damage resistance. It's just straight up Straight immune immunities to, to acid and necrotic. And it can be knocked prone? Uh, yeah. Doesn't say it can't be. That's weird to me. You, you throw that whirling ball of snakes upside down. It's like trying to like kick a ball, <laughs> knock it prone. <laughs> right? <laughs> Doesn't make any so sense. So I assume it has a couple of... Legs? Like if you can knock it's it through, like there's got to be. It like rolls over. It's got these tiny little stubs just like <laughs> hanging out. It's got it's got six little nubbins on the underside <laughs> that just kind of like. <laughs> yeah. Um, so as for its actions, here's where my main problem comes. Uh, and Adam, this will annoy the hell out of you. Um, it has multi attack, which makes three attacks. It does one attack with its flurry of bites. Yeah. One attack. Flurry of bites annoys the hell out of me because even the flurry of bites is just a one attack thing. Sure. Like anytime flurry has come up, it's usually more than one attack and now you don't have it. Anyways, just Sorry, to, isn't flurry of blows one additional attack on the end of your as a bonus action? Uh, yes, but as long as you are making other attacks with it. Mm. Well, isn't that what this is? You're making other I, attacks. I, I'll get to the rest of them. It can make one. Uh, so it gets three attacks on its turn. One flurry of bites one constrict, and one maw. Cool. Maw. Yeah. Ma. So Flurry of Bites <laughs> is a single weapon attack with a plus 12 to hit, range of 10 feet, and it does HD 6 plus 7 piercing damage. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay. It is just the one attack that bothers me. If I'm running this thing, I'm giving it two. Um, no, sorry, my no, players. I, I'm, I'm fine with that because thematically when I'm running it as a DM, there are dozens of mouths coming at you, but one will connect. Or it's it's because of that dozens of little uh, dozens of little hits equals this one big one. Yeah. Um, you flavor it that way. It just make doesn't make sense. Why is it not like three attacks of a much smaller damage thing? It it just bothers. because it's because it's more rolls. They're just simplifying it to make it. As... I'm I'm okay if you're fighting a big rolling snake monster. Rolling three d twenty is gonna not gonna slow the game down that much. Anyways, I'm gonna move on to the constrict. It's weird the caltrops are gonna work on this thing. Yeah. Um, I'm going to move to the Constrict, which is a 15-foot reach. Again, plus 12 to hit. Um, and, but it has to target one larger, smaller creature. Um, basically, you do a bunch of... You do 3d6 bludgeoning damage, and then you're, the target is grappled. There's no save against it. There is, of course, the DC to get out of it uh, on your turn. But you get hit. You're grappled. Done. Um, until this grapple ends... Megan's very, are, very happy about the grappling and the swallowing in this. Yeah. These are your favorite freaking mechanics. This is why we invite you on these episodes. <laughs> I hate everything about this. <laughs> so, uh, until the grapple ends, you are restrained and taking an additional 3d6 plus 7 bludgeoning damage at the start of each of your turns. Um, the Typhon can have up to two creatures constricted. Cool. I Makes like sense. that. Yeah. I'm glad that we're starting to get that. There was no limit on how many creatures could be swallowed by the... Um, by the Sky Swimmer either. And you see that some of the monster manual can only grapple one creature at a time. Glad we're getting past this. Our monsters are getting legitimately scary now. Yeah. And I, I'm starting to enjoy this. And more like physically accurate. If there's a thousand snake heads, obviously it can grab more than one thing at a time. Exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, and finally, the maw attack, which is the one central large mouth that this thing does have, um, is a plus 12 to hit. It's got a range of 10 feet, much like everything else. It does 3d12 plus 7 piercing and 3d12 acid damage. Wow. 6d12 plus 7 damage. That's 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 not nothing. That's not well, nothing. Well, it's CR what, 13, right? 15. 15. Okay, well, yeah, that checks out. Yeah. Now, uh, in terms of lore around the Typhon, the Typhon is uh, created by the god uh, Clothis. 
who is the underworld god in in um, Theros. Clothis isn't necessarily evil. Uh, Clothis just seeks balance and everything, including the um, all of these silly heroes and gods who are trying to be uppity and and you know forge their wills ahead. Clothis is having none of that. He just wants um, the mundane world to continue. Yeah. Right. Um, let's just go with the norm. No one be special. Everyone just be the same. That's that's kind of Clothis' his whole jam. Well, that's really similar to Hades, right? Yeah. Like, Hades, if you set aside the Disney cartoon, actual Hades was very much just about making sure that everyone was in the right place in the afterlife. Yeah. You got the fate that you deserved, and everyone deserves to be here, doing a different kind of thing. This isn't punishment. This isn't evil. This is not swirling pools of... of untethered souls or fire and brimstone this is just you're done yeah the idea of the life is over and here's where you are if you are a tyrant then you're a giant crazy monstrous ever hungry like is that is that the parallel here if you were greedy before you are nothing but mouths looking to consume in the underworld yeah kind of yeah. right and and i mean greek mythology really uh reinforces that as well because that's Often what happened when you went to Hades and, and, and when you went to the afterlife in Greek mythology, you became your vice. You became your well, sin or whatever yeah. nonsense. Well, yeah. I mean, and that was reflected up through other religious, well, pseudo-religious texts like uh, Dante's Divine Trilogy, right? Yeah, yeah. Like the idea that the consequence fits, you know, what you deserve, right? Yeah. The, yeah. the punishment fits the crime on this. And so... That's very Greek. It's also very Theros. Yeah. Um, the one thing that did pop up in my additional uh, research here that, Adam, I think you would like. Um, when Clothis is heavily offended by an entire civilization um, that... As I often am, I was yes. going to say, it happens on a regular basis. Uh, <laughs> Look which, at you, France. <laughs> uh, which uh, often is when that civilization offends the concept of fate, which in Theros is a massive thing. Clothis is the kind of arbiter of fate in Theros. So when the civilization offends fate, think of like your Atlantis kind of level sure. stuff. Sure, yeah. Um, a priest will raise, and I'm not, I'm not lying here, a herd of typhons. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. A roiling mass of typhons. To release on a city. Just like, here's... Forty of them. Have fun, guys. But no, I see, I, and I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna twist that around because if I'm gonna bring this up, I'm gonna like in a campaign, I'm gonna drop that foreshadowing down early to say, hey, when when a civilization has overstepped its bounds, then Clothis is going to rely on the generals of the past to come and and bring, uh, let's call it solace, uh, peace to the region, which of course is him just unleashing these monstrosities to wipe clean everything and start over right mm -hmm. so th this is his giant you know control alt delete oh yeah reset yeah he's he's hitting alt f4 on this yeah now i did mention there was a real world connection so i just want to describe who typhus a uh, type sorry typhon also typhus they're the same thing depending on what you read but uh typhon who they are in greek mythology um was a giant so tall that his head touched the stars his torso was that of his man, but his legs were coils of vipers that would hiss and attack as he moved. So, gigantic titan that did what that. Was it, what was his, his dingus? Probably another 30 or so snakes. Okay. So, he doesn't have the dingus of a man surrounded by snakes? He just has just snakes? Snakes, yeah. Uh, his <laughs> main... Here, actually, it actually said so right now. His main head had 100 snake heads. <laughs> Oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah, that yeah. would make different sounds of animals. So no. it's roaring at you at the same time. <laughs> creepy. <laughs> what does the fox say? Anyways, his eyes were glowing red and would terrify anyone who looked upon them. Not all the snakes. It was his eyes that creeped people out. And he had what was called a savage jaw that would breathe fire. Dear friends, make your typhon breathe fire inside of your campaigns. Oh, you got to raise a CR. You're going to do that. Oh, yeah. Oh, 100%. This is getting insane. <laughs> his body had hundreds of different wings on it, and his hands were made up of hundred snake coils just like his legs. Ew. Ew. Uh, so what, what He was Typhon, a surprisingly gentle lover. Typhon was the <laughs> child of Gaia and Tartarus. 
I'm so disappointed that people can't see Megan literally flailing <laughs> <laughs> with displeasure. Right Everything now. about this. Yeah. So in, in Greek mythology, Typhon is a god and he is the child of uh, Gaia and Tartarus. Um, Gaia, of course, being the earth goddess and Tartarus being the murderous bottomless pit that where all the super bad souls who didn't go to Hades went. What um, a great combo. Yeah. Uh, there are some myths that say Hera was really pissed off at Zeus one day and wanted a god who was more powerful than Zeus. What so, day wasn't she pissed off at Zeus? Oh, all the time. Well, if he would stop turning into swans and fucking peasant women, this wouldn't be an issue. <sighs> the Greek, yeah. am I right? <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, seriously. <laughs> so, uh, so she had. The, so Hera. I hope that's one of the noises that his head made. <laughs> <laughs> So, so uh, she had. It would say Hera contract uh, contracted these Some two sort of disease. These two Zeus. gods to make. <laughs> That's how we got goosebumps. Uh, now, <laughs> I'm just trying to move through, through this. Uh, Typhon is regarded as the father of all monsters, um, and it is said that he never slept and that he married Echidna, not an Echidna, but Echidna, who was considered to be the mother of all monsters. So this guy is the guy who created in Greek mythology a lot of the uh, Hydra and these these other monster like uh, the the Medusa were all created by Typhon. And they've all got this snake theme going on. There's all a lot the of snake theme. theme in Greek mythology. Yeah. So if you want to have fun with these guys, you want T focus campaign. Throw a Typhon or oh or yeah, in absolutely them, right for the UNT. That's great. I would also say that. Lizard folk might worship one of these guys. Yes, 100%. I, w I would also say there might be your ancient, like your rare ancient green dragon or black dragon might have one of these things on retainer. Yeah. Yeah, but I really do see this as a uh, warlock. I mean, not a traditional player character warlock, but a warlock or a, an evil sorcerer trying to summon an ancient general into being and releases this by accident. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. So if you want to know what to do with your long dead, ah, he's not a lich. I want him to have this. I want to pull the rug out from underneath my players. And I want to resurrect this 3,000-year-old warlord from, bam, it's a Typhon. Here we go, right? And yeah. this thing can wreak havoc on a city. Yeah. And uh, it's it's only a CR-15, which I go, aw. Like, I, if there was one that I think could be a really great, not end boss, but like penultimate uh, the one that you think is the end boss, but is not the end boss. Right, yeah. Like, that one big monster to fight at the end of a campaign, I want it to be a Typhon. So I'm giving it the fire breath. I'm giving it, like, different things. I'm, I'm building up to it so it could be that. Because CR-15 feels weak. Honestly, do you want to know how to make this CR-18? Just give it max hit points. Oh, how yeah. many more rounds is it going to last doing this devastating attack over and over and over again, right? Like, yeah. It, the idea that it regenerates 20 hit points around is big. And yeah, you guys are going to knock it down 90 hit points in the first round, but then the assassin and the gloom stalker and your healer and you're done. Yeah. Like, like, like the, well, the big, the big shots have been blown at this point. Right. And you, you're done. This is it. My, my big thing is it's, I still think it's weird that it can be prone. I wish it had damage. Or, uh, the imagery in my immunity. mind yeah. is hilarious. Well, I think there's probably a an upright to the maw. Like, there's probably a couple of eyes on the yeah. top of it. So if you were to flip it upside down with reverse gravity or something, it would take half of its movement to wrap around and coil and whatnot until it gets upright again. And then mad as shit come I, after. I was also thinking when you use the term caltrops, I imagined a snake like running across a bunch of like actual spikes like it would technically gut it it would yeah. gut it right so if you yeah. have a thousand snakes running along the ground and you threw down like a pile of caltrops it's, it's gonna respond to it right mm. whether yeah, but again you can see your of the mind there we go i'm gonna like. homebrew the idea that um that if when because there are all of these different swarms of snakes and stuff that are in the monster manual caltrops is going to be the most effective way to get rid of them yep mm -hmm. yeah makes sense to me I like that. I'm just gonna do double damage with Caltrops because I gotta, I gotta slither across that shit, right? <laughs> anyway, was that it for the? That's uh... it. That's that's everything. I mean, it. I could go over the other creatures like the Sphinx or the Cerberus that this guy came up with, but we don't need to. No, the look. I I think today, so so far, this guy is my favorite. He's he's better than the sky. So we haven't gotten to Megan's yet, but he's. He's way, way more he's fun. He's unique. 
right? Like he, the sky not... swimmer is just a big flying snake monster with big mouth. The, yeah. the, this guy has uh, a lot of flavor to inject into a campaign. Like there's a lot going for this guy. Yeah. Well, before we get to Megan's, then I just want to remind everyone that you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and at r slash it's a mimic on Reddit. You can also reach out to us through our email at info at it's a mimic dot com because. Well, we love hearing from you guys. And any questions that you send us will get added to the lists for our upcoming mailbag episodes. So, Megan, now that I have pimped our shit a little bit. Pimped your shit. Uh, <laughs> Let's talk about a deep crow. A, a, a deep crow. A deep crow. Not a shallow crow. Not like a... Not a Cheryl crow. Not a Cheryl crow. <laughs> We're talking deep crow. Fucking I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> So these guys are from the Acquisitions Incorporated book. Um, again, I feel like they are quite overlooked, but I, as I was reading about it, I'm like, oh, this is just a, a big fucking bird. But <laughs> I think the mystery of them is the part that I like, because no one actually really knows how they're created, how they're birthed. Well, a mama deep is. crow and a papa deep crow. They do have a mating process. Got drunk so, one night. And made more little crow eggs. But a lot of people like claim that they were um, old, like, uh, uh, what are they called? Um, um, what is the term that I'm trying to think of? Elder gods? No. Um, they were like, they were owned by other, like, wizards. What, what is that? The, the familiar, oh, familiars. Yeah. yeah, they were the familiars of, like, big, powerful wizards that were abandoned and then just grew to abnormal size because of being imbued with random powers. There's also, like, these other, like, Thoughts were like they were just born with a vile essence and then were just birthed and then grown. Like there's so many different reasons as to why they exist. B O U S S rather than R O U S S. What? What are you talking about? Rodents of unusual size. From oh, Princess Bride. I was like, what the fuck? But they're birds of unusual <laughs> size. I'll shut up. If you would, please. <laughs> He was trying to make a movie reference, which we well, you know, we points for effort. Day. All right, all right, yeah. you're gonna get you're gonna get half points. Half points here. You don't like the Dungeons and Dragons movie, but you like you like that. So, uh, yes, of course, I like Princess Bride. I'm a human being with a soul, so yes, I like that movie. <laughs> all right. Anyways, deep crows. Um, so these guys here, like, if you think about the way they look, they do tend to look like a giant crow, but like with characteristics of weirdly enough insects. Like I was probably. about to say, if this is what you think crows look like, Megan, you need to no. really stop the mushrooms. Sorry. <laughs> Do not tell me how to live my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so like at first glance, like from a distance, it would look like a normal bird. But up close, it actually has like weird mandibles and a weird like claw mouth hole and like deep set red eyes. Like they're creepy looking fucking birds. Yep. So, and they are a large monstrosity. So they are not small. They are like, and this is just the deep crow. There is also an ancient deep crow on top of this. Ooh. So, oh my. But um, to get a little bit into their stats, you can kind of understand them. Um, they are technically only a challenge rating of nine as a deep crow. So this is technically the weaker. Yeah, but when you say only a challenge rating of nine, that's like a, like, honestly, most parties at level eight can fight it. Yeah. But still, you need to be level eight to fight it. You'd think that a crow would be a level three kind of issue. Well, this is a very large crow. It's very it's very big. It's bigger than the ones that were in Deep Dark Irradiance. Yeah. <laughs> what is the CR of a rock? It's the only other like really big fucking bird. I don't know. It's a hard question. Yeah, I, would not, I don't know that. I'll look it up. Yeah, you stop that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. While you're looking that up, um, so these guys here, their main stats are going to be their strength and their con at 20 and 18. Um, so they do are quite sturdy, hefty birds. If you think crows, they're yeah. pretty resilient in life as is. Um, their dex then 16. Um, their lowest stat is their intelligence, but it's still an eight. So as we kind of discussed, that's pretty smart. But mm -hmm. what I love about these guys is that their wisdom and charisma are 15 and 14, which to me checks out for crows because they're smart. They know mm -hmm. what's going on around them yeah. and they have personality. Right? They have memory, they have personality, and these things are thought to be actually, they hold grudges. So they remember, right? So I love the fact that they really tied in like what we know about crows into what this big monstrosity has become. So I really like this. I like that you would get harassed by one of these things yeah. at like level six. And then it comes... And it, it grows comes, with you. Yeah, yeah. It comes back and, it, like, and it's just constantly following you. Mm. Or was the familiar of someone in an older campaign... Olin, like, like Locky. Oh my goodness. Raven. Zoltan becomes a deep crow. Exactly. That would be great. So like, let's say like he just got 
so pissed off with Lockie one day, he just leaves. Okay, Megan. Never I, comes back. And now is a big, big bad in a future campaign that you I, play. I, I just, I just want to say. I am taking notes. Uh, yeah, yeah. that that was not the realization to make with this man sitting across the table from us. You're welcome. Because he will put this against us. Hey, yeah. we still hey, have to go hey. back there. Muhaha. Okay. Yeah. He's but, literally writing it down. Yeah, I know. I'm literally writing it down. But I think that, that ties into the fact that no one really knows how these are created, and a concept is thought that they are familiars of old wizards that now have a grudge. Yeah. Right? And then they became evil, dark creatures that now just hunt. Lily, all they do is hunt and eat things, right? So um, so that check that kind of checks out. Their saving throws are con and wisdom, so you can't really trick one of these things, in my mind. Um, and then their skills, if they have a plus six to their perception, their stealth is plus 11. Yikes. So, and that, that kind of ties into some of their abilities, which I'll get into. So their senses, though, are blind sight of 30 feet, dark vision of 120 feet, and passive perception of 16. I like it as blind sight, too, so that you can be walking through the literal dark and not see this thing here, and then all of a sudden, like, how many, how many eyes open up, like, blood red eyes yeah. open up in the darkness? And then, <laughs> and then, like six of these motherfuckers. Except it, 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 it speaks deep, so it's that. not. Kaka, it's like. Whoa, yeah. and, they, and they don't have a language. They speak their own kaka language, right? So you can't communicate with one of these. I just want to like eavesdrop on a conversation between two deep crows, right? Uh, see, no, just because it's called Deep Crow doesn't mean they don't have high-pitched little voice. It, they could just sound like little baby crows, for all you know. Maybe they just chirp. <laughs> oh. That would be so creepy coming out of one of these big fucking birds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just to, you know how, like, I, I, want, I want you to picture a horror movie where there's a big, scary fucking monster, like a man, like a ghostly, like, huge juggernaut level of beefy, eight-foot-tall Jason Voorhees yeah. that giggles a children's laugh. No, Kicks down the door, dusts his head, like, "Hi guys!" Oh Lord! <laughs> yeah, I, look, that would that would scare some people. Yeah, and oh. just entertain the shit out of others. But like, it doesn't it's have creepy. to be big and deep just because yeah. it's it's large, right? Like, there are lots of big animals. Dolphins make high pitched noises. It's true. Dolphins are scary and smart. That's but... a hot take. Dolphins aren't <laughs> scary. Um, in the water, they would be scary. I, would uh, not, I don't want to swim with dolphins. I mean, not not to put too fine a point on it, the sexual assault rate of all animals in existence is dwarfed by what a dolphin does. I guess that's fair. Okay, guys. Off topic here. <laughs> but dolphins are scary. And dolphins are mean. Just because you can swim with them does not mean they're very nice oh. creatures. They, yeah. They tolerate you, not the other way around. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Anywho. They're magical creatures and I will accept no recourse. They're magical creatures. All right. Back to Deep Crow. They literally have a freaking Death Star porthole weakness <laughs> to them. You just need to throw a pebble down that thing and the dolphin is dead. They're not magical creatures. They're poorly designed freaking sexual assault beasts. <laughs> so, there it is. That's what I'm giving you. I feel bad for the seals. <laughs> This does not get a seal of approval. <laughs> Stop it. What? All right, I'm finished. All right, now let me oh. dive back into it. <laughs> Dan's going to flipper us off here in a minute. <laughs> okay, for reals. <clears throat> we have to get back under the porpoise of this conversation. Oh God, God damn it, Adam! <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> All right, before I go into uh, a little more detail about their actual abilities uh, in battle, the good thing to know about these guys is that they do tend to live by themselves um, unless they are in their mating process, which they do go out, find a mate, make egg babies, live with egg babies for a year, and then they go out and find their own, like, nests and stuff. Okay. So, so the good news about Deep Crows is that there's no attempted murders here? <laughs> Isn't it ravens that's murders? No, it's crows. Is it yeah. crows? Yeah. What, ravens are an unkindness. Yes. That's right. Yeah, okay, got you. <laughs> anyway, um, and then uh, the only other reason why they ever leave their caves is if they are going to be hunting. So these guys are technically hunters. What they love to do, of course, is the dive and grab. They're very classic to soaring and staying hidden above. and then Very much like actual crows. Yes. I have been fucking dive-bombed by so many crows. Well, now imagine being dive-bombed by a large crow with mandibles. <laughs> that is what this is. So... Hmm. Um, so it's or a, womandibles. We're equal opportunity here. That's true. Whatever, you know. Yep. 
you're gonna make me die. Like you're just going to give me an aneurysm. Yay! <laughs> oh god. So okay, so into their abilities, so their magical resistances are that they have advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects. The magic resistance is yes. Okay. Yeah. Shadow stealth. Uh, so while in dim light or darkness, the deep crow can take the hide action as a bonus action. This scares the shit out of me. Because if you're just in a forest with dim light, this thing can hide anywhere. Yep. Like that scares like, And this thing is huge. It's not small, but it can hide. Uh, just <laughs> hiding behind a tree. Yeah, just like it is a tree. Oh, no. It's creepier than that. It's I want- holding the one branch in its mouth. Yeah. No, it's way creepier than that. I want you to picture the little party of halflings. That are going through the woods, like the little, you know, uh, what what are the nomadic halflings? The uh, Kender? The, the Lightfoot. Oh, halflings, yeah, yeah. right? They're nomadic. And it's just a, a small little tribe of them moving uh, with the little donkeys and stuff. And this thing is behind them, hopping like a crow does. Mm-hmm. Hop, hop, hop. Wait. Look. You know his head is all twitchy like a bird's as well? Yeah. Oh. And just picking off the halfling in the back. Yeah. Love it. Um, and then the downside to them, of course, is they have sunlight sensitivity. So while in sunlight, they have disadvantage on attack rolls as well as on wisdom slash perception checks that the rely on sight, basically. So I think that's like your your strategy. If you were being stalked by one of these in a forest, get into the light, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if you know what it is that's coming after you anyways. All right. So its actions are it does have multi-attack. These guys can attack three times. Good. Um, three halflings. Yeah, exactly. Up, up, up. So it attacks with its uh, mandibles or its claws. So the mandibles are only a D, 2d10 plus 5 for piercing damages and only 9 to hit, but it does have a, five, a 10 foot reach. So again, that kind of checks out for being a, the CR9. It's not overly overpowered, but it's going to happen multiple times. You're being yeah. pecked yeah. at by a crow, right? Yeah. Um, and then it's claw attack, which is a plus nine to hit with a five foot reach, uh, which is another 2d6 plus five slashing damage. Yeah. So. And if it hits you with the mandible, it will grapple you and hold on, hold on to you in its mouth. Yeah. It does specifically say that these guys can like hold on to anything. Like. So they're not just big peckers. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> what? <laughs> now you're trying too hard. <laughs> Talk to me more about your hard pecker. <laughs> That's the quote of the episode. <laughs> I'm glad that we got Megan on fucking mic set. <laughs> oh, Lord. Can I retire now? No. No? Okay. No. The year's almost done, though. <laughs> All right. So, and then this brings us into the ancient deep crow. So, again, there's less known about how these things come to fruition. Some think that it is just the regular deep crow grow old and becomes an ancient deep crow. Or there is some kind of magicalness behind it. No one really actually knows. Or if they're just two completely separate beings with just commonalities. There's really no rhyme or reason for their existence. I'm I'm sorry. I'm I'm reading kind of the the things as we're going through here. Yeah. And I just like the little tag at the end of Ancient Deep Crows uh, here that says, um, whether these gargantuan specimens are elder deep crows grown to a great size or some higher form that holds lesser deep crows in thrall remains to be determined, ideally by someone else. Seriously, stay, stay away from, from these them. things. Yeah. <laughs> that is the tone of the Acquisition yeah. Incorporated book, and it's a load of fun. Yeah. Very cute. Um, so they do have their own layers that kind of describe them a little bit. Um, so <laughs> deep crows and ancient deep crows roost in places both deep and warm. So you will find these, I feel like in my mind, I imagine them more mountainous or like within like lava formed, yep. like mountains, um, surrounded by forests so they can stay within like the deep darkness. Um, but yeah, I like that. And then they do have regional effects, which is really cool for, of course, like kind of like on the plane of like an ancient or whatever dragon. That's kind of like the same concept. So the region containing an ancient deep crow layer is transformed by the creature's presence, which creates one or more of the following effects. So you can kind of play yeah. with this as a DM, which I kind of like, as they say, you could do this or you don't have to do this yeah. in this book. I appreciate that a lot. Exactly. Right. So some of the things that you can do. So a supernatural shadow turns all bright light into dim light in underground regions within six miles of a layer. I like this one because I'm now imagining an open plain that is dark. Well, it it's uh, also, this thing can now hide as Everywhere. a bonus action in a 12-mile bubble yeah. around its lair. So you have a long way to run to get out of its area, right? Yeah. But it's almost like you would feel that if you were, again, describing this as a DM and they're walking up to... Or, like, happened to cross a layer of this thing. It's suddenly mysteriously dark. 
Yeah. And it's just dim light, so technically most of your party can see perfectly fine, but, like, would your team really notice it? Would you require them to roll a perception check to really realize that suddenly it's dark and it's not nighttime? It's mm-hmm. not, like, you know? So I think it's a really cool thematic piece. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. Um, you can do intermittent echoing cause. <laughs> can be heard coming from all directions within six miles of the lair. So these guys aren't quiet, you know? Yeah. Like... <laughs> They like being loud. <laughs> it's creepy. <laughs> um, and then subterranean beasts within one mile of the ancient deep crow's lair serve as the creature's eyes and ears, alerting it to the presence of intruders and making it all but impossible to surprise the ancient deep crow. So the same, it, it, they feel like a dragon, like a dragon to me. Yeah, in a lot of ways, they're they're very similar. Yeah. Can I just say these guys sound perfect? For beefing up your Curse of Strahd campaign. Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, God, yes. With the creepy eyes, the darkness. Like it, it definitely has that dark the hearing feel. The, the hearing them six miles away. Yeah. You've got all the were-ravens, but the were-ravens are terrified of the deep crows that hunt them. Yeah. That's why they stay in human form. Jeez. Um, the one thing I find that the deep crows, both ancient and normal, are missing is the mimicry the mimicry trait that you find like Kenku or That's ravens, or, it's not crows. I, I, I know it's ravens and not crows, but I mean it's not that far of a leap. I just love the idea of an echo you know uh ringing out through a canyon of your own voice saying something you said twenty minutes ago on your walk. Yeah. I might give that to the ancient, but I'm not gonna give that to a basic. To the ancient, crow. yes, yeah, I w I would agree. But like you could put on some serious, like, otherworldly cosmic horror level. Uh, they really feel fuckery. cosmic horror, yeah. right? Like, they don't feel necessarily like a monstrosity. They feel like an aberration in a lot of ways. Yeah, they they yeah. feel they feel Lovecraftian. I feel that's why they did not give them a language, though. I feel that's why they just said they speak their own deep crow language because these are that's it. It really ties back into the fact that they are just a bird. Yeah. yeah. That just happens to be mystical and magical because of whatever means they were created from. They have no rhyme or reason as to why they hate you unless you actually slight them and they remember this from years ago. Right? Yeah, like, and they are unaligned, so it's not like they're malicious In as any well. way, shape, or yeah. form. They just want to live their own life, and then if you if you bother them, they're going to come after you, right? Like it's, it's like running after a goose. You just don't. You know where else I want to see <laughs> these guys? In one of these massive, just huge caverns in the Underdark. Just full of these things. Kind of like bats, like hanging from the ceiling. Yeah, but you know that you've got this, we got to travel for four and a half days to get across this canyon and we're on a, a rowboat or something, right? Yeah. Like, And you can, you know that you don't stay near the walls. You have to go through the center area because, yes, there's some big scary thing in the water. Yeah. But it's not as bad as the deep crows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, if you think, like, so the ancient crows, their stats get beefed quite a bit. Like, they jump from a CR 9 up to a CR 15. Who? Um, so their strength ups to 23, their dex 16, their con 23, their intelligence 10. So now they're... Average intelligence. Average intelligence. Well, average human intelligence, yeah. But their wisdom jumps to 15 and their charisma jumps to 19. So you so. These things are a pile of stats. Yeah. So you can't fuck with these things. I think it's pretty crazy. How many hit points do they have now? Um, on average, 13,000. Yeah. Yeah. No, really. No, no. no. What? No, how many actual hit points do they have? Oh, sorry. I'm looking at the wrong... Where am I here? Hit points. Uh, 187. You're looking at the challenge rating? I am rating? looking at the challenge rating XP. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> I'm, I'm like, 13,000 I'm so used points? to XP being hit points in my brain. So I'm just like, wait a minute. No, so it's only 187. But it's 15 D12 plus 90. Yeah. Yeah. So, and there's... I mean, with an AC of 18, you're not going to be digging this thing down. Yeah. Uh, their speed is 20, but their fly speed is 80. They hit and run. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Again, yeah. This, that checks with the dive in and swoop, right? They're coming after you in the air. Dive, swoop, hit. So they, they fly in. They hit you three times. They take off and then hide. Or grab one of you. This is like a great set piece. They've so like, got that grapple in their mandibles. Yeah. They so, just grab you, pick you up, and drop you. Excellent set piece of someone just getting picked off by one of these and taken off into somewhere. And you're, you know, it's just a cute little like side one shot of yeah. let's go save our friend or let them die. This is a good way to crack that turtle shell. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah. Because they do say that, like, what they like to do is take food and then bring it back to their hide and then let it live in their nest for a while, right? And then it actually says that they like to drop them and repick them up to soften them up a little bit. Oh, that's delicious, right? Uh, 
And that just is from the book. Tenderize their meal a little exactly, bit. Exactly, right? So I can't even imagine like and just it doing that as it's flying back to its uh, lair. You and your what? friends can see your friend being dropped and re-picked up and dropped and re-picked up as it's flying back to its lair. I absolutely love the idea of you have like a CR 18 party and you have two of these things swoop down and pick up two members of the party and drop them in a nest full of regular deep crows. Oh yeah, they're and, baby deep crows. Mama, daddy, like ancient they, deep crows. And they've crow. softened you up as these things, I don't know, move at half speed. Like they're, I'd, I'd make them baby. Yeah. I'd, I'd give them fewer hit points and stuff. But they're going to hop around and try to eat you as the others are climbing up the cliff face to come rescue you. Amazing. Harassed by one of these ancient. Yikes. Yeah. That's a fun CR-18. And they say there's nothing to do with high levels. So so you know those characters you could build that are just, they're full of that uh, die, get up, die, get up, die, get up abilities? You mean barbarians? Uh, well, barbarians, well, there's a bunch of multi-classes you could do. You could get like six or seven different methods on one character to just especially by level 18, yeah. to, like, fall unconscious and stand back up. How frustrated would the Deep Crow be? Grabs a guy, drops him, still not dead. Grabs a guy, drops him, still not dead. Grabs a guy, drops him, still not dead. Yep. <laughs> Fun thing to role play. <laughs> um, but in the end, these guys, they have the same magical resistances and the same shadow stealth. So these, even though they're, like, three times the size, they're a hot, they are a huge monstrosity. Um, they can still hide in dim light. As a bonus action. <laughs> um, they're actually like holding a tree in its mouth. I'm not here. <laughs> I am hidden. Um, they have the same multi attack. They attack three times. Their mandible is the same, but it ups to um, d. T- it's still only two d ten plus six, um, but it's a plus eleven to hit. And again, it happens multiple times. Their claw it's plus eleven to hit, uh, but still only two d six plus six slashing damage. So still small amounts, but again, that's not what they're going for. They're not going for the big attack. They want to keep you alive to eat you later. So yeah, yeah they're, and, and, they're gonna and, fuck with you. And yeah. like like with a lot of these flying monsters that we've seen, picking it up and dropping it is a monster amount of dice that you're throwing at a player. Yeah. Or or a creature. So they don't need to hit hard. They just need to be able to grab you and carry you, you know, eighty feet. I absolutely love the idea of of picking up the horse mm-hmm. first. And disappearing up into the darkness. And then all of a sudden, you hear a terrified whinny, and then a horse explodes beside you. On the you. ground, yeah. That is a good way to introduce an ancient deep crow and to the And like, get the fuck out of here. Yeah. And, and I want to say, like, Dan's really harping on this. Oh, he's holding up a tree. And look at him. Hand. Right. But they're all stealth. They, they're just going to find darkness to yeah. hide, right? Yeah. And bird bones are light. I know these guys are big, but they're going to still perch in trees. Yeah, they're going to be in the canopy somewhere. Yeah. Hanging out and peeking down, right? Um, so this piece I was waiting to get to because I think you would really like this, Dan, because it speaks to what you are talking about earlier. But they have something called the Shadow Caw. <laughs> shadow Caw. So the Ancient Deep Crow releases an ear-splitting caw. Each creature within 60 feet of the crow um, and able to hear, it must make a DC 17 con saving throw. On a failure, a creature takes 10 or 3d6 psychic damage. They say the word ear splitting, but they don't give It's not thunder. Well, it's, and it's not thunder. Well, I'm, I'm okay with it not being thunder because they've got this weird otherworldly kind of feel to them. Yeah. I, I, bet it, I bet it warbles. Yeah, right? Yeah. But, I mean, deafness. Mm. Say the word ear splitting. No, I mean... You're level 18. It's it's non-consequential as it is now anyways. No, I, it, it's, it's not, well, level 15. But, no, it's... In my head, it's ear splitting because it makes you like. It scares you. It scares you. Yeah. It's loud. But it is psychic, right? If it was yeah. thunder damage, I would say yes for the deafness. But I mean. Creepy. It's just creepy, right? <laughs> it, it's just. For me, it's it, it's like a. Uh, like you see a scene with like a flashbang in a movie, right? Where like there's that high tendonitis and then it slowly comes back in. Um, and they're often but it, but bewildered it's... and disoriented. I like. But it's not physical. It's psychic. That's the point. Yeah, right? I know, I know. So, so I, I know I wouldn't give this deafness. It's not, uh, it makes sense that it's psychic. If anything, I would say this should have a fear effect to it. That's what I was saying. Or it that, like, yeah. like it's trying to scare you or like uh, paralyze you almost. A confusion, right? maybe? Yeah, something, something like, like that. that. Yeah, yeah. Because they do have legendary actions, which as a legendary action, they can use Shadow Caw at basically any moment. In a battle of the legendary action, which is pretty cool. Yep. Um, other legendary actions they have is detect, which is they can make a wisdom perception check, um, or they can use a wing attack, 
which is the ancient deep crow, beats its wings. Each creature within 10 feet of the crow must succeed on a DC 19 dexterity um, throw or take 13 or 2d6 plus 6 bludgeoning damage and be knocked prone. So, like, let's say you're barbarian and your paladin get too close. It just goes, get the fuck away from me. And then fly And then takes speaker. off and then yeah. starts from the beginning, right? So it's hard to catch it. I think that really checks out for crows where it's just like, well, fuck off. And hop, hop, and flies away. Fuck off! Fuck off! <laughs> <laughs> So the flashbacks to our last <laughs> campaign right now. So the uh, the thing that that strikes me with this is that it's a legendary action as well. Mm. So the idea of playing with flanking or giving advantage to your rogue is right out the window because you're not going to get all of your players. Uh, look, this is one big monster versus all of your players at once. So no matter where you are in the initiative order, everyone else is going to go before you come back to this, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So traditionally speaking. They, like, players slam up against this creature. Except for your squishy spellcasters. Everybody else is in there surrounding to give advantage, to flank, to to work together to limit the escape on this guy. This allows him to just, poof, there you go. Yeah. Um, but can you do the wing attack? Is the wing attack standard or is it only for a legendary action? Only a legendary <laughs> action. Um, so you're not using this to escape? No. no, but in the legendary action, sorry, it also says at the bottom that once you do the wing attack, you can move up to half your fly speed. So Which the are these guys 40 feet? Is sure. to just flap and poof away. Like, yeah. that's the concept of it, so... Uh, up into the canopy. Yeah, exactly. And then start, again, start its hunt from the beginning, right? Yeah. Until it gets shot down by your stupid ranger or something. Stupid rangers. They're always dumb. <laughs> yeah, assuming the ranger could hit it. But, like, it could literally use its legendary attack, like, to poof up into the canopy and then bonus action hide. Can I just say that you guys need to be proud of me for not giggling at the word canopy every single time that we say it? I've been really struggling this, like, last You. Time. This is you struggling? Are yeah. you struggling right now? Yeah, this is, it's not good. Do you want me to say the word canopy again? Yep. Canopy. 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 You know, you're not going to get me with it. Canopy. At this point. Canopy. <laughs> No, I've got it. I've got it under control. Yeah, you got it. It's not like when we start talking about all those roiling masses of snakes and stuff for Megan and the snakeskin sloughing off. Or when we're talking about cuticles with Dave. Ew. Oh, Dave's got a problem with hangnails. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dave is not. not like and, me. <laughs> and unfortunately, we both Adam and I know it very well. So every single time it's me, Adam, and Dave. Yeah. Yeah, there's cuticles getting mentioned somehow. We're getting we're getting that in there. I'm sorry, Dave, I'm gonna have to do that now. Yeah. Yay! Yay. Yay. One of us. One of I us. I feel like I can't. I feel like Dave and I have this silent, like best friendship. <laughs> Dave Dave has legit nicknames for everyone on this podcast except for Megan. Yeah. Who he calls just totally normal Megan. Yeah. Because yeah. he's He's got that weird distant respect thing because pretty sure you will kill him if he steps out of line. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. He, <laughs> he's terrified of you. Okay. Ever since yeah. you shaved Terry's head just to win the hair contest. <laughs> Take that. Would <laughs> you glad you have natural protection, Dan? So, so I, I just... <laughs> fuck off. Fuck off! Uh, fuck off! <laughs> uh, so, Adam, I did want to mention this real quick because you did, you did spark... Um, something in my brain when you're mentioning like the the tenderizing and like like that's how you crack the turtle shell. Yep. Um, can we build a like monstrosity that is basically just a really large otter? <gasps> I would love this. Why? That like picks up adventuring parties in their boat as it floats on its back, its monstrous back down a lake or a river and just cracks the boat on its chest to get it the things inside i mean we could i feel like you're just creating like um what's this from avatar appa the flying oh yeah yeah, yeah. you're just like creating that but in an evil form yeah 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 so i i don't i don't need that i've got enough other crazy water things i find that would just be utterly ridiculous and on that note, um... Yay! <laughs> How many puns can we fit in one episode? <laughs> this was too many. Like, I, there's was, a limit and we, we reached it. Is it just becoming a punishment now? Oh, for me, yes. <laughs> oh, it's beyond that for me. This this is this is torture. Yeah, Dan's ready to send me to a punitentiary. <sighs> Stop! 
<laughs> All right. So um, do you guys have any campaign ideas for yours? Something that you want to use for like a one shot or really cool? Thing? Do you want to grab dice? Yeah, let's grab dice. Yeah. A natural 20. Oh. I got a 7. 14. Um, I I mentioned it briefly earlier, but the idea of making these guys like the big bad of a um, UNT lizard folk snakes uh, theme. And I mean, because the Typhon is very otherworldly as well, like dipping this and, and has fathered the Cerberus and the Sphinx into being, I would have... This entire campaign be um, involve the underworld. Have your party have to go to the underworld to stop the Typhon from uh, wrecking the the surface world. Um, so the entire campaign would be you know dealing with snake cults and um, eventually you want to summoning this thing and then them succeeding in summoning it and then your party having to go your tier four route into the underworld to you know battle the cerberus to get into the underworld to to find the the essence of the old warlord's soul that they have risen to end it there rather than do that and then get back out of the underworld escape the underworld to see what kind of damage this thing has done because it's it's again kind of like the tarask it's one of those you don't really kill it you just try to stop it and then count your losses because even when you kill a Typhon, the way that it works is it just goes back to the underworld. Yep. Because it's from there. Yeah. So there's really no, no like, full full death for those things. No, no. And then, I mean, in, in a year and a day, another snake cult on the other side of the world could try to summon this thing back. Ooh, and then it would come back with, like, the same scars that you left it with. And oh, and, and, you are. and a memory of you. Yeah. yeah. Love it. I really like the idea of the general or warlord or whatever. You need information from him. And he's trapped inside this creature, and you've got to kill it and carve him out. Mm. As he, and as he's dying, you get your information, and then you send him back to the underworld. Oh, like a physical imbo. Oh, I like. That. And then he's, he's got to slowly grow back into the Typhon again. And, and and he is aware that if if you do kill the Typhon, get him out. He gives the information. Hell, make this guy grateful. Like make him repentant of his uh, old butchery ways. Right, but. His curse is to grow back into this thing. I don't even need him to repent. I just need him to have, you know, you've got 30 seconds of conversation time. Otherwise, you got to cast Speak with Dead. Right? Like just... I, 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 I like the idea of him being more spiritual. Like, I don't think he's... Oh, I like the idea of you going into the underworld and finding guys that are mid-transformation, too. And I would use the UNT abominations and the Malisons yep. and stuff yep. like oh. that. To... Mm. And and you could you could even have it infect some of your players or some characters and have, like, a nation of Simic hybrids. That have come from this thing. Yeah. Oh, but they're all snake flavored. All snake flavored, yeah. I, honestly, I would just use... You want UNT's to work. got yeah, enough yeah. there, so... Yeah, Malsons themselves have, like, five different options, so... Yeah. I so. like it. That's cool. Anyways, Megan? Um, for the Deep Crow, I like the idea that this is one that can grow with your campaign, literally, in the sense that, again, there's no rhyme or reason why they exist, so why not have it be someone's familiar that is turned on them? But I would do it where, like, you meet a random NPC that everybody falls in love with. And they have a weird obsession with crows, and you don't really know why. Until later in the campaign, all of a sudden you get attacked by a deep crow that's coming for its revenge because this guy once threw a rock at a crow. And this crow's been following him, so he has gone slightly crazy. That's a real world thing. Like, crows remember exactly. who the hell you are and tell other crows who you are. Yeah. So if you piss off, like, a murder of crows, they will hunt you. Yeah, but I think yeah. I feel like you can't really control how you're... Your party members are going to react to a random herd of crows. So you can't really control the fact that they would piss them off. Yeah. So I feel like it would be an NPC that they just picked up along the way that almost that person has the backstory of they pissed off this crow yeah. and later on it, they get picked up by a random crow and then your team decides whether they're going to take the time to go and save this NPC they may have fallen in love with or not. Hmm. But it becomes like almost like a side set piece. Again, I wouldn't cool. use it as like your main big, big bad, like we've said. This monstrosity would be like a side story should they choose to follow it. I like the idea too of your guys kill the evil wizard at the end of, I don't know, level three. <gasps> and it, yeah, and it had a crow familiar that yeah. then pops up again. You know, Loki gets killed by somebody and then Zoltan comes back to revenge him. But it's no, a that, romance that story. Track. 
I, I think it would be very cute. Lock, uh, Zoltan would like go into Loki's like hidden stores that Zoltan, of course, would know about. Grab the treasure and give it to the party that killed Loki as a reward. Yeah. Like, oh, thank you. I'm free now. Thank you for the freedom. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> love it. What about you, Adam? Oh, uh, for the sky swimmer, I want. It's it's not a campaign idea, but I I would I would throw it in there because I can't build a campaign around a sky swimmer. I just I can't. There's, yeah. There's not enough to it. What I can do is build a really cool set piece around it. And everybody wants to ride a dragon, right? Like, that's a thing that probably happens more often in D&D than we talk about. When I you mean, get they made a whole three. movie around it called How to Train Your Dragon, so... Did, did, well, a whole trilogy as well. Yeah. Better and a TV show. And, mm. frankly, it's better D&D than D&D movie is. You're not wrong. <laughs> the TV show is actually, like, there's a few TV shows based in that world, but, like, the TV show is actually good, too. Okay. So good I'll take your word for it. It's yeah. a good show, but it's uh, decent. But I, I like the idea of you needing to fight things while you ride your dragon. And there's not enough things in the air except, what, an Elder Tempest? Mm. So you can fight clouds, which Elder Tempests are fun and neat, but you do it once. Yeah. Right? You can have Sky Swimmers, right, up there in the air. Like, you know that... In order to cross from this part of the continent to that part of the continent on the back of your dragon, on your airship or whatever it is, you've got to fight these things. And I just love dragons versus sky swimmers. I You mentioned earlier that idea of like them being ridden by storm giants. Like, Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the, it, like they're really cool mounts for storm giants. Yeah. And you could have like three or four storm giants on the back of one of these things. Because storm giants are large size. Yeah. Well, they kind of look like uh, the big worm things from the um, Avengers movie that with the Chitari that fly in from from. Really, you got that feel from them? I, I the, a little bit of that feel from them. So, like, have them like drop off an army of like medium sized creatures. Hmm. Yeah, I, I get I get that from the Krokoktoic from for Knowles. The yeah, but the Krokoktoic is just like a big angry slug furry. Bus. Yeah, like right, it's, like it, it's, it's it's pretty gross. It's but. pretty gross. This thing flying through the air, like swooping down, and then you know, whatever creature you want to pop off off the side of it, and then it flies back up, right? Mm. Yeah, I I also like the idea, and I would, I love the fact that they're amphibious. I love that they're going to come from below too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You you hunt this thing up to the, like the lake in the mountains. And you're like, all right, where is it? Mm-hmm. I, I was thinking of the idea of hunting these things, and like it would be cool to have a tribe where a rite of passage is to take one of its teeth. And, and so, it has so many. And yeah, but then you got, eventually one day you come across one that has almost no teeth, and you don't know why. Yeah, <laughs> it just gums you to death. Yeah. Just bludgeoning damage. I, I just like you. You're part of that tribe, and you go, and you got your tooth because it ate and killed one of your friends and there's still a tooth alive. Yeah, and, that's the only and you just take that one and run done. <laughs> like I'm not fighting it I'm not grabbing it from the source I'm just gonna <laughs> thanks Steve I'm and run away I'm actually a coward yes yeah, uh. yeah. I like the idea too that it has like baby teeth and adult teeth like it sheds teeth so every once in a while you're just walking along and a mo- just massive tooth just lands <laughs> on the path in front of you that's a great random encounter I love it that's a great way to punish your, your players as well uh, incidentally storm giants are huge not large I said large but not okay. huge yeah. so but they should still you should be able to put three of them on the back of one of these things yes gargantuan is just real big right it's, like there's no actual there's, legit... there's a bottom limit of uh, gargantuan but there's no upper limit of it yeah yeah so any final thoughts on monstrosities before we wrap it up I want to do more I think they're fun yeah Honestly, there's not a whole lot. You can see we're dipping down into uh, into tier, tier three, three at this yeah. point, right? Yeah. So there's not a lot of high level monstrosities, and the other ones that we covered before were above level twenty, right? So there's not a whole lot sitting there in that tier four range, um, unless you start looking at dragonkin like hydras and stuff yeah. when it comes to Theros, and most of those are named. It's a very specific kraken or a very specific hydra. And that's where With you get the purpose variety. and a storyline. Yeah. 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 So. yeah. Anyway, that's it for this episode of the It's a Mimic podcast. If you'd like to support us, you can head over to www.itsamimic.com and hit our fancy donate button or tell your friends and the rest of your D&D party about the podcast. We're available on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube, as well as most podcast apps. And don't forget to come back next week when we're having our 100th episode of the main podcast. Oh, my goodness. Okay, bye. 
Thank you for listening to another It's a Mimic production. Inquiries, shoutouts, requests, and mailbag questions can be sent to info at itsamimic.com. Okay, so uh, what the fuck is with the languages in D&D? Like, I'm talking monster languages, because if I can be honest, mine has an intelligence of seven and doesn't get a language. Dan, your monstrosity speaks common. Yep. And you've got... (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, there's no consistency whatsoever with these monstrosities and whether or not they speak, and if so, what they do speak. And so, anyway, how do you handle, as a DM... Monster languages and speaking monsters in D anD. d What is the challenge? What's your go to way of of dealing with this? Let's roll. roll. Eight. I got a nine. Six. I first discovered monstrous languages when I looked up the Manticore stats, and I went, hey, "I'm sorry, it can speak." Okay, that's interesting. I didn't realize that was not an option for other monsters. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and then when I had it, just like hang out and talk with you guys. You guys got befriended, and you had a pet Manticore. Running around. Leo, I believe. By pet, you mean someone Leon. who hated us, but Leon. liked us, yeah. but hated us, but liked us. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was that was as close to friendship Lockie ever got. So. Yeah, that's true. But, I dare you. <laughs> <Anyways>. <laughs> but it, it Am was I wrong? No. Always. <laughs> but no, it, it was interesting because I had to come up with a mentality. Like, what does a manticore society look... By the time that you have language, you have at least a semblance of, of social societal interactions and what does that look like? And so I had to create in my own head canon for what a manticore colony looks like Mm -hmm. and how the manticores work with each other, which gave it a political headspace about it'll only stay with you guys if you are the strongest ones around because, and, and so I had to come up with the whole reason of how it works the way it does based on that shit because it spoke freaking common. What a pain in the ass. Agreed. Did it did it speak its own language? Like, do manticores speak manticore, or do they speak common? They just speak common, right? Which was just so fucking weird for me, right? And so, and when it comes to things like, I'm trying to, well, I mean the the deep crow, right? Yeah. What does that society look like? The, you so you have your own language, and that's all well and good, but is it is it beyond dogs barking to communicate with each other? Because if you can't communicate with other races, then is it is it a language like? Uh, I don't know. Sex. I feel like sometimes when I look at these monstrosities, I remind myself that they're actually supposed to just be monsters, and that they won't always communicate with the common world. They will, like for instance, the deep crow. There's no reason for it to understand language and be able to communicate with other humans. It's just gonna eat you, you know. And so, like, if I ever have like a party of people, and I don't know, we've talked about languages before, where there's so many ways to get around language as players. Mm. Like, there's spells you can use, there's magical items you can use, there's, like, in-the-moment rituals you can perform, that if you really, really wanted to talk to a monster, you could make it happen on some level. But I think it's also a good reminder to put a monster in front of your team that doesn't speak their language to remind them that language can be a barrier and do it early in the game. Yeah. So that throughout the game, they were required to remember you can't necessarily communicate with everything all the time. So when you do throw them in front of a monster that can't communicate with them, they're somewhat prepared for it. Yeah, I mean, language fills a role in the game a lot like carrying capacity and encumbrance do in my mind. They're a necessary evil Yeah. Um, that is often overlooked. Yeah. Right? So um, it's only when there's a one la- that one language puzzle where the VM goes, all right, so who speaks Elvin? And everyone looks around the table and goes, well, shit, there's no elves here. Uh, also, I forgot to write my languages down in my character. Yeah, yeah, uh, I do now. <laughs> Why, yes, I do. Just give me a second, scribble, scribble, scribble. Um, but honestly, I look at the intelligence score of the monster, and if they have anything kind of a between a four and a, uh, four and a seven, then they're, which is quite common in a lot of monster stat blocks, then they, if they have a language, they speak in broken whatever language it is, but it's still broken. Like you could make sense of it, but it's, it's dumb speak. Um, if it's less than that, then you're just getting impulses and opinions like, uh, and desires from them. Like, uh, um, that they're hungry, that they need to feed other 
Do your insight along. checks yeah. or your animal handling checks to understand. What or it's... if you've cast like speak with animals, right? Like that's going to yeah, be the another same fucking thing. language spell. I just yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, if it's higher than that, then yeah, they speak that language and they speak it fluently. Um, but a lot of monsters with higher intelligence that speak will know that if a party of adventurers is attacking them and hasn't done their research, they might not understand the fact that they speak those languages so they might hide it from them for that moment of uh surprise or just to have some additional advantage against the party so you just made me think that when it comes to languages i, I look at at wisdom has always been your ability to have tactics in the moment okay, right yeah. because all of your beasts have high wisdom and it's usually because it's how they interact with the world around them right yeah. whereas intelligence is your strategy overall which means if you've got a language, it's so that you can communicate and strategize. If you've got a, a language, you can set traps. I can see deep crows setting traps. Yeah. Right? I can see the... the Not mechanical traps. No, no, no. Like, no, no, like, no, like, like ambushes. ambushes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, uh, or at least, you know, knock this boulder down yeah, like, to block yeah, the way, yeah. right? That's what I'm, I mean. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like a deep crow. Well, I, I could see a deep crow doing it, but like setting up a trip trap or a pit trap or something like... Uh, a, okay, and now I'm just imagining Deep Crow's thing. little claws, like, putting together a wire trap. That, like. That's because I've gone on deep ends on YouTube and seen, like, crows bend wire to get something at the end of a bottle and pull it out. It's true. Like, crows are specifically the Deep Crow, I could see doing this kind of stuff. Yeah. Like, your average, like, bleh monster? Yeah, no. Hmm. Yeah, but, I mean, I think that with the Typhon, the only reason it, has, it speaks common is so that it can... Mock and taunt as it eats everything. Oh yeah, yeah. Right, and there's no. Uh, I, I I wouldn't even say that. It's it's more a remnant of its past being. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So and and the sky swimmer. What's the intelligence level on, on seven? Uh, I got a seven too. What what was the deep crow, Megan? Do you remember? Uh, eight. So so okay. that big ass bird is smarter than my snake monster. Yeah, but my gigantic, my gargantuan flying snake monster doesn't speak at all. Hmm. Well then. <laughs> I guarantee we'll be sitting cross-legged recording Wednesday. So I would love far, to yeah. see you guys try and sit cross-legged. <laughs> Fucking rude. <laughs> She's not wrong. I could do it. I can do it too, but I can't do it for two hours. I just, yeah, I would, that's the thing. Is like I'd like to see it happen, and then for an extended period of time. Yeah, I'm talking like like the 20 minutes. My right leg has gone asleep. Yeah. By the end of it, I'm lying on the ground and be like. You'd full on so Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh man. Okay, Great. let's 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 get this. I'm sure, you probably want to delete all of that. No, I'm gonna keep it in. <laughs> you can make that a cold open for one one day. It's, I would love it, to see you guys sit cross legged. <laughs> it's cruel. It's only two minutes. It's fine. We've had longer. I think I'm funny. You'd be craning your head back and, and just run. Thank you for listening to an It's a Mimic production. <laughs> okay, you're done. Get it. <laughs>